On this episode of Pennies Going In Raw, we have our very first CEO interview, Tim Reeser of Lightning E-Motors. We discuss Bitcoin hitting 40K, This Week in the Market, SPAC Attack, and our swings. Hey, yo, check one, two. This is Flavor Flav in the building for the Atlas crew. Atlas trading, what the fuck is up? They're traders, they're prodigies, and then there's legends. Rob, 4%, baby. No way. 4 fucking percent. Buy the fucking dip. Hey, who told me about IDEX? Like, dude, what the fuck? Like, someone just made, like, a m- lot more money than me on my trade. You find out, likes this game of pennies. Did you check the portfolio? Pennies. 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 The margin for error is so small. I bet Warren Buffett never did that. And they out there making money right now off of penny stocks. The two guys is putting their work to make y'all rich. The pennies we need are everywhere around us. Time to think big. Pennies going in raw. Featuring Dan, Deity at Dips, and Hugh Honey. Produced by Vinny Strokes, baby. Welcome back to another Pennies Going In Raw. Today is Sunday, January 10th, and what a crazy week with the capital being breached, Bitcoin hitting 40K. I mean, we got a lot to talk about. Yeah, I mean, this was an insane week. For the first week of the new year, I mean, I, I was exhausted. And, and half of my money is in escrow um, because I'm moving in accounts. But And I was still super exhausted. How about you? Yeah, I mean, this was a really good week. I mean, I could only hope that This whole year is like this week. Uh, The market really seemed to respond really well to a lot of things that happened, uh, except obviously the capital being breached. (laughs) But it seemed that that was just something to provide dips for us. How did you play that on Wednesday? Yeah, so I I kind of talked about it, but most of my money's in escrow. So I actually ran out of buying power because I'm only really playing with like 20%. Explain what escrow is, because I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of DMs saying, hey, I can't find the escrow ticker. I'm trying to put half of my money. <laughs> yeah, so currently what I'm doing is I'm, I'm rolling over accounts um, inside a few different brokerages. So primarily I use TD Ameritrade and I use Centerpoint. And right now I'm moving them over from the individual accounts to um, you know, so I'm really consolidating the accounts right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're just moving money. Yeah, I'm okay, just moving gotcha. money, but cool. but the escrow part is the middleman. Neither I nor TD Ameritrade can touch it right now. Okay, but after, so aside from your money, right, you just ran out of money buying dips? Yeah, I just ran out of money buying dips and I don't, I'm, I'm not going on margin uh, right now. So yeah, I ran out of buying power. So I sold some um, long-term stock that I had in like Amazon to buy more dips. Okay, so you were super confident uh, that the market was going to rebound when that happened. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, you could see the market, the dips were being bought inside the market. I mean, we had the capital being stormed and market was still green. Um, so I, I felt pretty confident in anything that was, you know, being overreacted. We, we did talk about it. How did you feel when you saw that SPY was up 1% on the day and the news reports were coming in that the capital was being breached? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it, what it did it go red for just like a second or did it because I mean, it was ripping throughout the morning so much. But, you know, I saw my money going down. I saw a spy. I saw the news. And, you know, it was one of those things where you have to realize, will this affect the market tomorrow? Do I think that those guys are going to stay in there overnight or another country is going to see this as a good time that we are vulnerable and this could drastically affect the market. Personally, I didn't, especially after Trump told everyone to go home and it looked like they were listening and that everything was just about done. So yeah, I I added dips too. I I didn't have half my money in escrow. So that was nice. I didn't run out buying power. And, uh, you know, I I touched red when it happened and then it just quickly rebounded uh, towards the end of the day. So I was definitely excited about it because it, no, there's nothing better whenever you see it go red and then it just skyrockets again. You you get the validation like, yeah, I did the right thing adding those two. Yeah, definitely. And, and we do we got a lot. Did you get a lot of DMs? Because I know I did um, asking what to do. I, I feel like there was a lot of panic throughout FinTwit. Yeah, uh, I, it was funny. I tweeted things like if you didn't know that the uh, capital is going to get invaded by Vikings, like uh, – <laughs> you shouldn't be trading. This was obvious, which was a joke. But, you know, it's crazy the amount of people that were like, 
how did you figure this out? Like, were, were there news sources? Did you kind of just put two, two together? Like, no, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's, uh, Fintwit is going to go crazy. I mean, everyone should go crazy. It was such a crazy thing to happen. Yeah. Especially when it goes to the market, though, uh, it, I think it all goes back to conviction. Right? Yeah, definitely. But but I do want to touch on something because I did tweet about this, and and I think that it gave some mixed feelings. Um, you know, I we're not going to tell you how to trade because that's not that's not our game. Um, but I think buy sell short talks about a lot that if you're ever worried about something, like for instance, the DMs that we got, like, hey, like, do you think this is going to lead into weeks of rioting and a uh, you know, and Q and all this stuff. If you're worried, sell half, sell half. It, it puts you in a good position because you still have your average. And if it does work out that, you know, we start World War Three, then, you know, you can always buy back. So if you're, if you were fully in the inve- invested in the market and you couldn't buy any dips, you know, it wouldn't have been the worst thing to sell half, you know, just for the peace of mind. Yeah. Uh, peace of mind is definitely big, um, especially, but it is one of those things where if, if you have all your money in the market and your stocks aren't going up, obviously it is a very t- bad time. To be, like, are you're more investing than trading? You know, I mean, you really aren't trading, I guess. Uh, yeah. But I know that's how a lot of people try to build their accounts from small to big, so they finally can, let's say, hit twenty five k or ten k, so they can really start playing around. Uh, which even Gary said recently was. You know, he likes the idea of having more money in there. You know, that's how they're making such big gains. And there were some responses saying maybe that's not great for newer traders. What do you kind of feel about that? Like, what do you, I know you like to go big into very few plays, but what do you think about that for newer traders? Yeah, I, I really think, and I did see all the hate that Gary got. And, and listen, you have to understand, okay, Gary took an account from $500 to over $500,000 in a little under 16 months. Gary knows how to do it. And and something that we talk about on the PGIR a lot is scaling up and and you know understanding when you have the hot hand to press it and when you don't have the hot hand to lean off and maybe even stop trading for a little bit. You know, Zach took a month off and that that paid wonders. When we're talking about Gary and what Gary said, I think it's really important to note that Gary knows what he's doing. He knows he has the hot hand, so he's pressing it. If this is your first week in the market, no, don't do that. Uh, you know what I mean? I think that that's, we're overcomplicating the situation. Gary knows what he's doing. He's been scaling up gradually for the last 16 to 18 months. And now he's at a point to where he just wants to make as much money as he can. And he's going to press the hot hand. And I think that's what he meant. He wasn't talking to the brand new followers, the brand new Fintwits. He was talking to the people that have been inside this game now for 12, 16 months. And he was telling them, listen, we have the hot hand right now. The momentum's on our side. Let's go for it. Because when we get to August and the Momo dies down. We're going to wish we took that opportunity. Yeah, exactly. I think I think one thing good to mention about like what Gary does, though, is, is he has money on the side ready to add more of these dips in case something like what happened Wednesday happens. And it's there's risk management involved. And it's not just I put money in stock, stock goes up, I become rich, you know, there, there's more to it. And but but with that being said, uh, I mean, there was way more that just happened in this week besides just spy ripping and the capital being breached. But we plays in Bitcoin. I mean, weed plays went insane over the the Democrats taking over the Senate, uh, I believe was the exact catalyst for that. But I mean, aside from that, Bitcoin as well. I mean, you want to touch on this? Yeah, Bitcoin. I have no interest in Bitcoin um, right now. Uh, I think that if I personally think based on the chart and not that it has to follow this, but based on the chart, based on the fact that any dip has been any dip so far has been absolutely murdered and accumulated and soaked. Um, I really think that based on the chart, the, the, the fact that the dips are just being soaked, I think that I think this genuinely could go to 70,000 inside the short term. But again, when we think about Bitcoin, it has 60 to 70% of dumps. When it dumps, it dumps 60 to 70%. So I think that that's really important to keep in mind. Um, but I really like Bitcoin right now. I, you know, EQ, OS, that's my favorite Bitcoin play. I think that that thing's going to rip 
with Bitcoin, and I really think Bitcoins can go significantly higher. Yeah, I was actually thinking we'd see a dip sooner. Uh, it depends on how this 40 is handled. And uh, yeah, I mean, if it just rips through the 40s, I mean, hell, I mean, there's it's almost seems like there's almost no looking back. I mean, it's been so crazy. Um, the fact that it was so cheap just so recently, uh, just what, like 9K just a few months ago. Just touching on, on, on the point about on the point about when it dumps, it dumps. Um, there's, I was reading a statistic on Bloomberg that 93% of Bitcoin is owned by the whales or like a small community of people. So if they start dumping it, it, it it's going to take another dump 50, 60, 70%. So I think that that's really important to keep in mind that if you aren't like, I have no Bitcoin, um, this would not be the time that I'm buying Bitcoin. <laughs> Although the FOMO and the MOMO is so strong, this is not the time because when they dump it, they dump it. They lock up the float, send it to 70K and then dump it back to like, let's call it 30K or 20K or 15K. Yeah, but I also feel like a lot of the people that are holding such large amount of Bitcoins, you got to think like uh, the Winklevoss twins and people like that. Aren't they just holding most of it like forever? Yeah, they're just holding most of it forever. But I'm talking about the guys that you like the market makers of Bitcoin that you don't know what their names are. Um, they, the they, you know, I mean, this, yeah, the, the, honestly, whenever they the say they, they are holding it back, oh, this is who <laughs> they are. Oh God. Yeah. It, yeah. But in, and, and in most of the time in stocks, it's just like some furu that's like, you know, uh, soaking dips or something, you know, or a market maker soaking dips, but in Bitcoin, there's a literal, there are literal whales that own 90 plus percent of Bitcoin. And when they decide that it's going to go up, it rips. And when they decide to dump it, it dumps. I mean, we see it. We, we've seen it over the years. Um, you know, again, go shoot up, dump 70 percent, shoot up, dump 70 percent. And then and then they accumulate for, you know, a few years and then they run it up a bunch of hundred percent and then they dump it. Um, so based on the chart, I really think that it's C70K. But I would not be buying my first Bitcoin here. Um, I think it's heavily manipulated. Um, you know, I mean, it's been proven that it's heavily manipulated. So I would not be buying my first Bitcoin up here. But I think that Bitcoin has a lot left in it. Yeah, uh, it's definitely going to be something to watch. I mean, obviously, it always is. And, and it's always fun seeing it when it does this and it gets all the media attention. And just like in 2017, when it ran like crazy, uh, weed was running like crazy back then, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And it's going this week. Do you have anything to touch on that except for the fact that it's uh, just just Democrat? I mean, I love weed. We know that. But um, <laughs> a word. But- I, I kind of similar to Bitcoin. Um, I would not be buying into the huge, large weed companies now because they're up hundreds of percents right now. But that being said, I think that the administration is going to start rolling out, um, you know, tons of bills in favor of weed, you know, maybe decriminalizing federally, um, you know, things of that nature that will just be huge catalysts for weed. And and we'll be looking back in five, 10 years at like TLRY and, you know, TLRY is a, you know, $1.5 billion company, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, I think we'll be looking back in a few years and this stock will be you know, 40, 50 bucks. Um, I would not be shocked if the administration just starts rolling out huge weed bills. Yeah. So the market cap on TLRY is 1.7 billion. I really wouldn't be shocked if this thing was trading inside the forties and fifties during this administration's presidency. Damn. You know, which uh, one weed ticker couldn't, didn't even get really hard this week. What? Ignite, Dan Bilzerian's company. (laughs) (laughs) Is that guy even still around? uh, I thought he was in jail. Uh, no, no, he's, if you follow his Instagram, you know, he's, he's still convinced that nothing he's done is illegal. Um, but now I'm pretty <laughs> sure, uh, he was using a lot of investors money. 50 million, I believe, uh, was how much they lost, even though he was using all, like all their money on, um, like yachts and pool tables and crazy shit, arcade built like arcades, uh, machines, but you know. He, uh, he claimed it was like marketing for uh, on like his Instagram and stuff. So it, that'll be interesting to see where that goes. Um, yeah. OK, so transitioning from this week, SPACs, SPACs in general, um, SPAC attack, AMCI, Clove, Gick, 
GHIV, um, even a baby spec, LMFA, a penny stock to above $2. Well, this week was insane for SPACs, um, especially Monday. Uh, Monday was was crazy. Yeah. All SPACs ran like off of each other, like 10, 15, 20%. It was nuts. What do you, what do you think about all that? Yeah. So, I mean, they're creating their own sector, if you will. And it's really awesome to see. Um, but I think that we do have to note something. Um, you know, it's great because SPACs in general, I mean, the only thing that you really have to look out for is who are they partnered with um, and what the share structure is going to be. I, that That's like the surface of it. Um, but I think it's something that's really important to note. And this goes back to a little bit of China hustle. And I don't want to freak anybody out. But as we see more and more SPACs happening and reverse mergers happening, that's when we have to be, you know, because when before, you know, when they're when they're backed by Chamath and they're backed by, you know, what's his name? Um, Bill Gates. You know, that's really great. But when we start to see Russian ship tankers, you know, doing SPACs and reverse mergers and we start to see 400 SPACs list and stuff like this, we as we start to see the popularity increase, that's when we really need to be you know, we need to hone in on the good ones and be able to sort out the good from the bad. Because as we see more, we're going to see a lot more that are complete nonsense, just, you know, trying to make a quick buck, uh, you know, something like that nature. So uh, I think that that's just a, a cautionary tale that as we see more SPACs, we need to be way more particular about the ones that we're, that we're choosing. But that being said, I really like the ones that we have on tap. I think they have huge potential. And it's really great to see SPACs creating their own sector. We need to find us a blank check company and maybe we could get a PGIR <laughs> SPAC, maybe an Atlas SPAC. Yeah. Really, really go crazy. Yeah, exactly. And then, but that, it's funny that you say that because that's literally my point is that once they start gaining popularity and people understand and learn what SPACs are, they're like, oh, pfft we can do this. You know, we have a few, we have a few, you know, 50, 60, 70 million, like let's, let's create a SPAC, you know, things like that. Um, and then they, you know, it goes back to, you know, they just start dropping offerings and they merged with somebody who's a complete BS artist, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm not sure of, like with how easy it seems to do some of these SPACs, like why didn't some of these companies like, uh, and I don't know the specifics, but like like Twitch in 2017 or 2016 when everyone was playing Fortnite on there, like why didn't they why didn't they merge with the SPAC or IPO then if it's so much quicker to SPAC, you know? Yeah, I mean that that's a really good point. And the thing is that when we look back at you know 2000s and the 2008s, a lot of reverse mergers were happening, and a, and a lot of fraudulent companies were getting listed from other countries. And so for a long time, kind of if we go back to diamonds and kind of like the shadow that the blood diamonds, um, you know, kind of cast on diamonds, um, same thing with reverse mergers onto legitimate companies. It, it, for a long time, any company that was doing a reverse merger was, was kind of like, you know, they had this dark shadow of like, ooh, muddy waters, you, you know what I mean? So for a long, long time, that really, that really was a dark shadow on not doing reverse mergers. And, and honestly, SPACs, that's what it comes down to. You know, I mean, that, that's, there's no difference. The only difference is that instead of a Chinese, instead of a Chinese quote unquote fertilizer company, it, it's an EV company, you know? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree with all that. And, and by the way, I just found out Amazon owns Twitch. So that, that explains that right there. Uh, but, but, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there, there just seems so many like, things whenever they're just popping like uh, could it be like a short-lived thing like hey you know we're doing good right now let's let's go public through a SPAC and they just go public super quick and then and then they fail do you think that you could see some companies doing that eventually with SPACs if SPACs keep up this high hand yeah yeah that's that's really kind of like where my cautionary tale comes in is that right now we're we're not seeing it but this is as a cautionary tale in, in two years if one person eclipses inside their head like whoa PGIR talked about this, um, is that people are going to see the opportunity to make a quick buck. And so they're going to do this with, and they're going to choose a company that they know full and well is not worth it, but they're going to make a quick buck because they get the funding, they can drop an offering, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
yeah, that's that's really what it comes down to is that, yes, we'll see more popularity. We will see, um, you know, more not I don't want to call them scams, but we will see companies that aren't worth the valuation that aren't doing a SPAC for the right reasons as they grow popularity and as the market and other people learn more about SPACs. All right. Well, go while we're talking about SPACs, uh, might as well just transition into our swings of the week, uh, since I'm sure a few of them are SPACs. Um, I'll mention mine real quick, and and you can kind of uh, can kind of see if you got any of the same ones. Let's see. So I, I definitely like the ACAM SPAC, the the car lots. Um, obviously, Clove from IPOC, uh, Clover Health. In AMCI are, are some of my bigger SPAC positions right now. What, or, and, of course, uh, GIK, um, which we had the interview with. Um, what, what about yourself? Yeah, so I have um, S-O-A-C-T-H-B-R, um, ACAM, GIK, um, GHIV, of course. Am I missing any? Yeah, I also um, have um, GHIV and uh, Theber, T-H-B-R. Um, Deeper yeah. had a good pop at the end of, uh, at the end of the day on Friday, which was nice. It, it had a good, like 12.7 entry, you know, around that 12.5 the last few days and finally hit around 1350 again. Uh, but yeah, these specs are, these specs are the main thing I'm really swinging and even trading as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm still holding my NVIV, but that's, that's longer out. That's going to be like an M, MNTB kind of a move. You know, that's farther out. I'm just going to accumulate dips. Obviously, still J and J and EBS, and then obviously the ones I talked about on Benzinga. I have been scalping the absolute heck out of NVIV. Your last week's swing, it has had some some crazy moves up and down. Yeah, yeah, and, and like I said, is that that's going to be same with MNTB. MNTB went mid eighties to over a dollar, back down to ninety, back up to a dollar, back down to eighty five, um, and then all of a sudden we saw a huge pop to one forty came back down to like a dollar 10 and then it for like two months just grinded up to 150 and then got a pop to two like 20 you know it, it, i i didn't even look at it and uh and i was up you know 160 percent and i was like wow great um so that that's how i'm playing nviv and um, uh another EQ, another yeah yeah that's the exact one i was gonna mention man eqos yeah go uh, ahead because that's really your, you've been killing that one yeah and we called it again on benzinga uh eqos that bitcoin sympathy play we're uh definitely definitely still swinging that one it hit above 22 went down to 1450 i mean it's been all over the place and it's been a super fun scalp gives you tons of good entries and hell it gives you tons of great exits as well it's just intraday and uh, I've been loving to play it and also have a core position as well. But uh, yeah, the la- with Equest, is that your last or you uh, you got a few more? Yeah, so that that's when I'm swinging the SPACs, EBS, J&J, um, and obviously NVIV. And then what I talked about on Benzinga. Yeah, and, and one of the things you mentioned on Benzinga, uh, you pulled the 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 mr barry from the big short just watched it again last night you you're you're gonna short spot um you say you're going to and and that's i mean it seems so obvious but it also seemed obvious months ago as well so and it's just kept ripping why are you doing this yeah so again i'm not looking and i think that this was of some serious confusion i'm not looking for spy to go to like 250 260 i'm looking for a simple pullback so that we can go higher. Um, I'm not really look. I'm just looking for a pullback. I'm trying to time a pullback right now. I am not in any way trying to burn down the market, as um, some of my DM said. Currently, I'm looking at a few things. I'm looking at one, the chart. I'm looking at two. Something else that that I touched on is called option flow, and I've spent some time looking into the option flow. And the option flow is huge because the option flow can really affect the market. Um, you know, we saw SoftBank buy billions of dollars of option calls, and that that literally affected the market and made the market pop huge. So I'm trying to time that. Now all those options that everybody, I mean, the option flow is ridiculous. Uh, someone that I follow on Twitter, which is a really good at identifying um, you know, option flow, is spot gamma on twitter okay and they released a chart and they said and i quote 
single stock gamma, 56% of this expires 115. I'll retweet that tweet, but I think it's really important to note that the that we're going to see volatility. So I'm trying to time the pullback. And and that and what I'm trying to time is that volatility, VIX goes over 30, SPY tops out around 385, maybe some exhaustion, and then we get a pullback to really I'm ideally looking for anywhere between 340 and 360 until we start to see the pullback. That's when I'll get a better idea of where it's going to go. But I think the volatility of these options mixed with SPY and OPEC and you know a few different things, I think that we ha- that this is a huge probability of a pullback. Now, that being said, I will say this, okay? If that volatility is matched with Robin Hooders who are just buying large amounts of Tesla, large amounts of SPY calls, and that volatility is matched with buying volatility, then we will just go to like 420, okay? And, and, and at that point, it'll just be huge exhaustion and then we'll need a pullback. So again, my thesis on SPY is that the option flow, okay, is going, that they all expire this upcoming Friday, okay? So that means that basically this upcoming week, when, when that volatility increases, that if SPY gets to that 385 range, right around that 385 and it starts to show exhaustion, mixed with that volatility if it isn't matched with buying volatility the okay, money printer is gonna we, stop going <laughs> yeah and and honestly i think that if you're along you should be hoping for a pullback because if we get a pullback to under 360 then we're almost, then we will just continue and, and again we talked about in the last podcast that my ideal situation is we get a pullback to 350 then we then Biden gets into office. He starts talking about a multi-trillion dollar stimulus package, and we just pin bounce hard for 20, for 30. And so if you're along, you should be hoping for a pullback right now. And if you're along in Tesla, same thing. Okay, we need a pullback to go higher. So that's really what I'm thinking is that if the volatility is not matched with um, with buying volatility or buying volume, then that coped with the way that the spy charts looking right now, we could see exhaustion around the 385, 384, and we could get a pullback, you know, maybe four weeks of choppiness, get a pullback. And then we, then, then we're running for four months. So you're kind of waiting for a pullback, but if that pullback is met with equal or higher buying pressure, what exactly are you going to do there? Yeah, so right now I'm I'm expecting volatility and again we're going to watch it. So if the volatility is matched with huge buying volume, then we'll be then that'll be clear and um and I'll completely abort spy pullback, you know, short term short if you will. Um congrats longs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if 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 you know, if you know that your grandma is just market buying Tesla and spy options, you know, DM me and um, I'll completely abort this position. But that being said, right now, I'm looking for that position. I'm also, something else to note is that the VIX doesn't go under 20 almost ever. We're at like 2130, which is pretty low um, for hitting all time highs during a second variant COVID pandemic that's going on over a year. Um, so I'm going to probably pick up VIX calls under 21, um, you know, maybe like mid February, end of February for like the 30 range. And again, that'll just tie into my hedge slash my short into spy. Okay. Well, before we get in to our Tim Reeser interview, we ran a poll on Twitter, uh, to discuss a play that all thin twit loves. Uh, the choices were sandal. Or sandal, S N D L, C L O V, and G H I V. And the winner was Clover Health, a medical provider led by Fintwit's new heartthrob, Chamath, last name, I don't want to butcher that, a billionaire tech investor who is quite the character on Twitter. Now, Hugh, do some DD. <laughs> yeah, hang on. Let me just let me just look into my brain. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Clove is, I think, a really good company overall. 
Okay. Um, I think based on where their valuation is that they should be higher. And so I think it's really good what they're trying to do. B of A just came out with a really good report. And I'll just, I'll just read one of the lines that um, from the B of A report. It says, iClove is a Medicare-focused health insurer that uses its proprietary Clover assistant technology to lower costs and improve outcomes by giving physicians tools to optimize the next best health care action. And the technology platform is free and Clover pays a bonus to doctors who use it. So just on that, we know that they have a proprietary system. So that means that, it, that you know, ideally it can't be cloned, you know, so that it, Johnson & Johnson just can't come up and do the same thing as Clove. They're also giving a bonus to doctors who use it. So there's an incentive for doctors to use it. And they're basically taking a system and making it better. Um, so when we think about you know, innovation, you know, it, it, it's kind of like going from, you know, um, a, a rock tire to a rubber tire, you know, it, it, they're not trying to change the system. They're just trying to improve it. Um, so that, that's how I look at Clove. Not trying to reinvent the wheel. Exactly. Not trying to reinvent the wheel. They're just trying to make it better, which I think is a really good system. Now I, I will note this because this is something to know is that when you're trying to innovate, and you're trying to take over a huge corner of a market like healthcare, um, that can be really difficult, mostly because it's kind of like Goliath. You know, you, you can't go up against the giant, blah, 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 blah. And that's bec- that most of that reasoning is not because of the ideas. It's usually because they don't have the funding. The great thing about Clove is they have a billion dollar backing or, or a billion dollar investor backing. Um, and they have the funding. So I think that that's something to really note that, that they have the resources. Most of the time when you're going up against one of these big guys, um, you know, and you're trying to take over a market that's so like, that has not been disrupted in years and you're trying to innovate it, you know, you need the resources and Clove has those resources. So, um, you know, I, I really like the direction that Clove is going into, I really think that, you know, as, as the pandemic ends, as we open up, you know, they're just going to see more and more. We saw them in Walgreens, you know, I think that this is just the beginning for them. Yeah. And for anyone looking to do some extra DD on, on Clove or a lot of these SPACs, actually, uh, we got a lot of this information from Manpre, uh, M-A-N-P-R-E-E. Uh, most of us follow him and retweet him a lot. He he really has a lot of good information on here that that anyone can read and, and you can learn a lot about DD and these specs as well. Um, so definitely go check him out if you want to learn more about them. Um, and with that being said, uh, we now have Tim Reeser, uh, the PGIR exclusive interview, CEO of Lightning E-Motors. Enjoy. All right. Today we have on Tim Reeser. Tim, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here, Dan. Okay, so Tim, co-founder and CEO of Lightning E-Motors, a company in the EV space that designs and customizes electric commercial fleets that's going public via a SPAC, which is GIK, Gig Capital 3. How was that? Did I miss anything or you have anything to add? You got it. (laughs) All right, man. Well, it seems like you've been fascinated by electric vehicles most of your life. Uh, Going back to the early 90s when you won the Ford Hybrid Electric Vehicle Challenge in college, what about electric vehicles piqued your interest and how did that eventually evolve into Lightning and Motors? Certainly. So I'll uh, give a little bit of of clarification. Actually, back in 1990, they were natural gas vehicles because... Uh. uh, um, so alternative fuel vehicles, but the um, so I'd always wanted something that was both innovative. Um, I'd been a car guy my whole life. I I built hot rods when I was in high school and college, and so love love cars, but wanted to do something innovative. And uh, when you look at alternative fuels, whether back then natural gas or now electric vehicles and kind of hybrids along the way, um, the opportunity to make the vehicle better, not just sustainable, but better. It always intrigued me. And even today, I'd say that's the biggest reason I love the company. Um, A lot of people assume it's because of the sustainability. And certainly I am passionate about making a difference. But uh, I also love the fact that the technology uh, is truly makes a better vehicle. The, The vehicles are more fun to drive. They're much better to ride in. All the aspects that make it truly better transportation. 
And so as a mechanical engineer, I love that part of making a better product, uh, an exciting product and innovating. And uh, that continues to pique my interest. And there's a lot of opportunity to continue to innovate in this space. And, and that's why I love it. Yeah. So kind of playing off that, you, you said it's a better ride. Can you expand a little bit on that? Like if, if I would I know the difference between riding in, let's say, your van and just a regular Ford van? Like what would be like one of the main differences you think? So night and day, the first one is is noise. Um, and this yeah. seems uh, not like it's not that big a deal, but when you think about the amount of time most people spend on their phone if they're riding in a van or would like to spend uh, on their phone riding in a van or driving in a van or, or talking to someone next to you or someone else in the vehicle, that noise makes a very significant difference on the comfort long-term, medium-term, and you notice it immediately. Now, sometimes it's a little spooky, even on some of our big coaches, um, when that coach, one of the, the drivers was telling me, normally, if you pull up to a stop sign and you don't hear that rumble and feel the rumble in the back, you, you, you it's broke down. So it's like, it takes a little yeah. while to get used to the fact that it's eerie. There is no noise, no vibration. Um, it, but from both a passenger and, and a driver, you notice it immediately. Um, some of the other things, the, the, because they're single, single speed transmissions, we've all kind of gotten used to when you drive it, you have to hit the throttle, hit the throttle until it shifts down. You no longer have that. You have a very linear throttle, very predictive and very, very noticeable. And then the other thing people notice a lot is regenerative braking, meaning you let off the throttle and the vehicle comes to a stop. Um, yeah. Not only is that obviously very compelling in terms of not having to replace the brakes as often, but most of the drivers in the first five minutes, they kind of say, hey, this is weird. But after about 10 minutes, they much prefer, and I personally much prefer for driving a vehicle one-footed, especially if you're in traffic, not having to get off and on a brake pedal is great. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so definitely one thing a lot of our listeners are interested in is a lot of SPACs. There seems to be a lot of EVs merging with SPACs. Could you kind of touch on why specifically you are merging with a SPAC and maybe why specifically um, gig in, in specific? Certainly. So one of the things I think that most people know at a macro level about a SPAC is it's faster. Um, and it's faster in two ways. One of them is it's faster in the sense that uh, essentially by the time we start looking for a SPAC to merge with, the SPAC has already done an IPO. So all the work of an S1 and all the legal work around getting, getting the IPO done and finding the investors is done by the time we started looking for a SPAC. So you, you shave off about six months of the process of going public. But the other thing that is I'll kind of say fast about it, but unique and, and certainly unique to the EV space is if you're a very fast growing company um, in a traditional IPO, you can only talk about last quarter, last year's revenue. You can you cannot talk about forward looking revenue. So if if you're at the cusp or right at the precipice of seeing extraordinary growth, it's difficult to get the credit for that kind of opportunity where you're at and the timing of that opportunity in a traditional IPO. Whereas in a SPAC, because it's seen as a merger, uh, the private company is merging with a public company, the private company and the public company can, together can talk about the private company's future. And this is true whether it's a SPAC or whether it's a traditional public company buying a private company. Um, in both of those cases, uh, both parties can talk about their future. And so in the case of EVs, where we're truly on this cusp where, especially in the commercial EV space where we are, we're going from uh, what has historically been in the United States, about a thousand trucks and buses, commercial vehicles total a year, to what I believe this year, uh, Lightning alone has uh, orders for twice that and and wow. uh, going into the next year, you know, three times that. And and certainly there's a lot of other people in, in different segments of the commercial vehicle market with big orders as well. And so uh, the, the, the market is clearly at that tipping point and really going crazy. And so the opportunity with a SPAC to talk about that future is compelling and, and a big reason why you see so many companies you know, in the EV space and in other spaces that are on a big growth trajectory using it rather than a traditional IPO. Definitely. Uh, could you, uh, just yesterday, there was a headline came out with uh, you guys delivering first all electric motor coach to ABC companies with over uh, an order for 200 zero emission vehicles. Uh, could you kind of touch on that and what that means for you all? 
Certainly. So if you look a bit, ABC isn't necessarily a household name, but they're a very large company. Um, they are uh, I, one of the largest motor coach providers in the United States. Um, part of uh, their customer base or a big part of their customer base are uh, campuses. And a lot of times when you say campus, you think of a college campus, which is certainly a market. Uh, but the other significant campus is corporate campuses. And so if you've ever been, for example, I was recently right before COVID, so I guess that isn't recent anymore, but I was at the uh, Google campus talking to Google and um, they have 500 motor coaches every day, uh, luxury motor coaches transporting employees around that Silicon Valley campus in Northern California. And so these are very common luxury vehicles, like I said, that many of us think about in terms of an over the road Greyhound bus, or we think about it in terms of a college campus, but there's a large, large number of these corporate campus buses, coaches, shuttle buses, vans, transporting employees. Um, obviously there's the other side we think about a lot, special events, uh, football games, that sort of thing where you see these coaches. So widely used vehicles. Um, I like it because I like the big stuff and I liked an engineering challenge. And uh, in electrification, the bigger the vehicle, the, the more nuanced and the harder the engineering challenge is for a variety of ways. So we like that part. But also there's a lot of on the motor coach side, uh, a lot of accessories, uh, accessorization are accessories that uh, uh, are really interesting to electrify. And you think about the fact that motor coach has a bathroom on board. You think about the fact that it has, you know, three channels of Wi-Fi on board. And so, um, so I liked the platform. It was exciting from an engineering standpoint. Um, we were able to leverage uh, our knowledge of what we've done on transit buses and our knowledge of what we've done on shuttle buses and scale it up, but use our, our platform of, of modular software and hardware to do it in a very fast fashion. Um, but again, this is one of the, the really dramatic ones uh, to, to the question earlier. When you get on this bus, you immediately notice the difference as a passenger, immediately notice the difference as a driver, smoother, quieter, um, everything running the way it does. And where you also notice is when you get in a parking lot, if you've, like I said, if you've been to one of these corporate campuses, you'll see these trucks also, these buses all sitting around idling all the time. They're big diesels. They leave them idling to keep the air conditioning on or the heating on. As an electric vehicle, they don't idle anymore at all. So you don't smell those fumes in these parking lots and in these parking areas. Um, you know, if you've been to a football game, same thing, you smell all those buses just sitting there idling. With an electric bus, uh, it's not, it's definition of idling is it's just running the, yeah, the heat and the air to... conditioning off the electric. So it's really a unique change and a lot of things change about it that I, I really, really like and I'm passionate about from both an engineering standpoint and a, a user usability, you know, really innovating and changing people's experience. Yeah, I went yeah. To, uh, to school in the SEC, so I can definitely imagine like how, how much it'll change when they're all electric. Uh, but, but you just mentioned how you were you were talking about that at a uh, at a campus right before COVID. And, and COVID's been a super interesting time for last mile deliveries, especially. Uh, and, and you guys specialize a lot in that. How do you think it will change as COVID ends or do you think it'll kind of still increase and stay on this trajectory? So I, I think we'll see a bit of a, a leveling off. I don't think it'll go down. I think we'll see it the acceleration curve not continue at the same rate. Um, to your point, Dan, we saw extraordinary acceleration, acceleration curve as people moved to buy online, not just Amazon, where a lot of that obviously had been going on for a while. Where we saw a big acceleration was things like grocery deliveries, where a lot of people hadn't done grocery delivery and other things like that, that they historically still went and bought pet food and groceries, many people did. And, and so there's been big acceleration in the, the non-UPS, DHL, Amazon business per se. Um, so we see a lot of new truck and new kinds of truck demand in last mile delivery. Um, when you think about people who are doing grocery store delivery, um, there's a lot of people today working with us on uh, <clears throat> both uh, semi-autonomous activities as well as on uh, unique trucks where the truck has a very unique truck box or body that allows you to load up groceries faster and keeps them cool longer and and this sort of, of unique application as opposed to you know what's kind of gone on in the interim of delivering these groceries in a car so uh, we see real growth in in some unique ways that people haven't seen hit the road yet but we see earlier on with uh, people looking at new kinds of vehicles and again because we support so many platforms uh, we can support very quickly these customers wanting to do something unique 
for example, building a custom box on the top of a, a Ford Transit uh, chassis. And so we see a lot of that. Um, and I believe we'll continue to see as COVID winds down, people prefer to buy online and have their groceries delivered. So I don't see that going away, but the, the acceleration curve may start to level. What we see though is, is also the other side of our business, which I call last mile people delivery. So we kind of have last mile goods delivery and last mile people delivery, and that's the coaches and the shuttle buses, and we do both. Um, but what we see happening is where the coaches and shuttle buses went dormant, um, this order you saw yesterday and that many more are coming uh, is about uh, these campuses starting to open up again and saying you've seen it with universities and and you'll see it now with corporations saying hey with the with COVID beginning to wind down they're all starting to open they're going to start opening their campus but many of them are going to still support social distancing on these vehicles so they actually need a lot more coaches and shuttles than they needed before in terms of volume more seats total, uh, more seats spread out, and many of them are using this downtime opportunity they've had to, to electrify that platform before they all go back to work. Um, so we're excited about that and seeing a real tick up in, in business on the, the last mile people delivery side too. Yeah, so I'm really happy that, um, that you mentioned the campuses again on the corporate side. Um, earlier, you mentioned Google. Um, will we see Google on your partner list soon? <laughs> I'll, 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 you know, I'll say this. I think uh, um, you'll see virtually every large customer on our partner list, uh, every large campus on our partner list. Um, yep. And I'm not saying that arrogantly or, or obnoxiously, but what we see happening is there's a real sincere, I'd say 10, 15 years ago, the, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons didn't have a lot of sincerity. They wanted to be green and said they wanted to be green, but there wasn't a lot of sincerity to it. Now today, their employees especially, but also their customers are pushing them to be sincere. And the idea yeah. that you can say I'm green and, and have all these 500 diesel buses that these employees ride on sitting outside idling, producing all this smoke in a very close campus, it's, it's pretty clear you, you don't even have, this doesn't have to be a nuanced uh, discussion about greenhouse gas, just the air pollution and the health uh, implications alone are very significant and the employees get it and the customers get it and the communities get it. So uh, the demand side on campuses and these corp corporate campuses is very significant. Um, and, and we're seeing it and we're well positioned because no one else uh, has, especially a, a repowered uh, a product like the coach. Uh, we're the only people who have a class three uh, passenger electric passenger van also. So we're well positioned to get that business. But I will also say, you know, those campuses, as they electrify, you'll hear other people talk about getting business from them, too. And, and that's healthy for the industry. So um, I'm, I'm definitely not claiming I'll be the only one, but I, I definitely yeah. expect to be a, a key partner to all those groups and, and get, you know, absolutely in talks with all of them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a huge part of your business was the fact that you guys really were, um, you know, I mean, we talk about it first to market. Um, you know, you just touched on. Um, you know, that you were the only that, you know, lighting or lightning e-motors is the only ones to have a class three. Um, you know, so you guys own, uh, I forget the exact number, but about 50% of the market share right now. Correct. Um, yeah. So, you know, at obviously competition, and I know you guys talk a lot about, you know, that, that you won't be the sole um, you know, you, you, you know, everyone's going to have multiple, you, you know, everyone's going to have multiple customers, you know, um, but how do the, how do you kind of see the market share changing, um, you know, as you know, I mean, you have Ford, it, it, although Ford has no plans right now, um, you know, other competition as they arise, how do you really see, um, you know, lightning keeping that market share? So I wake up every day and I think, you know, I've watched you all's podcast. You all are competitive guys, too. And so um, <laughs> I, I, wake, I wake up every day, you know, thinking about who's chasing, chasing behind me and making sure they don't get ahead. And so yeah. does my team. So obviously part of it is a, a drive and a leadership that we want to stay ahead. Part of it is keeping track of what customers want. But I think we've had two key advantages that uh, will continue to drive us. One of them is really listening to the customers. And because unlike the traditional truck market and, and vehicle market to date. Um, and I think when you look at passenger cars, like what Tesla did, they had the same thing. When you sell direct to customers and you spend your time talking to customers, you have a key first mover advantage because you get to hear firsthand what they want, what they need. You get to develop those relationships. You get to develop a, a customer intimacy with them in terms of, of serving their needs and making sure they're taken care of. And, uh, 
even though it's business to business, those relationships, these fleets rely on these vehicles, sometimes seven by 24. Um, the, the people who run these fleets, it's their reputation at risk. They, you know, they can't have accidents. They can't have down vehicles. Um, and so you, you develop a very close relationship and a trust. And uh, we've had the chance, first mover, to, to develop that trust over the last three years. And that obviously gives us a, a real leg up, but it's also given us a leg up in terms of understanding what they want and what they need. And so we're the first people, people that, you know, that the grocery stores have come talk to when they said, hey, we want to develop a new kind of electric delivery vehicle. Uh, we're right there with them and we're able to be at the front end of that. Whereas historically, the folks in the, the commercial truck and bus business, uh, it, it was a dealer who was talking to a customer. Uh, who would then talk to an outfitter and go see that. So sometimes the customer and the manufacturer are three or four times removed uh, from each other. And in our case, we've been very close. So that we'll continue to do that. We're very committed to a, a very high level of, of customer touch on service, on support, uh, but also on product uh, serve, uh, you know, the way we put the features into the product and what we do with the product. So uh, that's part of it. The other part is we're going to uh, continue to find, it, it, part of our vision and ethos is to find the markets where uh, other people don't necessarily want to play. And so you look at commercial vehicles in general, and you think about things like an ambulance or a motor coach um, or a shuttle bus, there's not enough of them made to attract a lot of them. And that's one of the reasons Ford has never made shuttle buses because uh, there's 13 to 20,000 made a year and it's not enough to, to match Ford's uh, approach of really high volume manufacturing. So we've purposefully chosen these markets where uh, other people's business model doesn't fit well, doesn't work well, and we can not only maintain it and, and most of them don't even want to play in our space, but if they do play in our space, we have, a, we're, we have the home field advantage. We're, we know how to play in this medium volume. It's not super high volume. It's not super automated, but it's not one off either. And so we're, we're really focused on staying uh, with our knitting and what we're great at. And other people aren't great at it. It's hard for other people to just come in and be great at it. And, and we're going to continue to excel in those spaces. Yeah, you yeah. just touched on um, your service. Uh, you've mentioned before about you how you have, uh, what is it, white glove treatment for for your customers. And I, I think that was super important because I, I've been considering getting an electric vehicle as well. And you mentioned sometimes it takes two to three weeks on the service. How, how do you guys perform that differently, especially with working with such, you know, different vehicles? So part of it is obviously having a, a more specialized business model. So uh, versus selling to a passenger vehicle where you have a lot of consumers, we have a much more limited and we'll always have a much more limited number of customers. So we have uh, you know, a few large customers as opposed to lots of you know, single vehicle customers. So uh, some of our customers have you know, 100,000 vehicles. And so uh, we, we are growing with them and we'll continue to grow with them. And so uh, that specialization of playing in business to big business means uh, we can cater to that. And so what we, you know, we have a, a team here and a growing team here of service personnel that we dispatch immediately to customers. So some of it is about just what you plan on. Do you have enough people to dispatch immediately and service it? Another part of it, which has been true in the electric passenger space too, is all about telematics and analytics. So we literally uh, have a team here uh, looking at a network operation center with all the vehicles and all the telematics to the vehicles live every second. And those telematics tell us things like uh, there's a drop in pressure across the coolant system. And we know, therefore, that you know there's a leak. And we're able to proactively call a customer and say, hey, uh, we've got a leak in the cooling system. Uh, we'll send a team out. Please ground the truck when, you, when it comes back to depot tonight. And so there's stuff like that because we have very sophisticated telematics and analytics that we can do that aren't traditional. But the other side is just simply having the staff and the ethos and the commitment that that's the way we're gonna do. When a customer calls, we're gonna drop everything and take care of them. Um, and that's obviously, you know, it's it's not only what you wanna do, but then you have to have the staff and the people and the travel arrangements and the ability to get out to those customers. And then it's about scaling that. So we'll, uh, uh, we're signing agreements today with very serious partners who already have uh, people in the field who can augment what we're doing. Um, we're also uh, almost daily signing up independent shops near our customers or our customers own uh, fleet service groups to and training them through uh, 
video and even uh, virtual reality video training on how to service these vehicles and how to support them themselves. So it's an entire ecosystem around how to make sure it's done. Um, and it, but it's a commitment from our side, recognizing we're working with fleet customers who uh, uptime is their business. They're making money every every minute this vehicle's on the road and they're not making money if it's not. So it's just kind of a, a different model in that sense. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think um, you know, the saying when it comes to you guys is that the money's in the niches. And, you know, you kind of talked about scalability. Um, you know, right now, if we look at the beautiful warehouse behind you, well, you know, uh, virtually behind you, um, you know, I, I know you guys have a pretty big campus that you're scaling into, if you will. Um, but can you kind of touch on, I think at some point, if, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, right now, you guys, your entire employees do the entire um, you know, manufacturing, you know, it, it's really not that much um, automation where if you went to like a Ford, you would see, you know, way more automation. So when you get to a certain point inside the scalability, do you think that you will have to or will um, go more towards automation? Because I think one of the videos that I saw on YouTube, um, you know, you guys had three or four people putting, um, you know, you know, putting together a van. So, um, you know, can you kind of touch on, on, you know, how, how you see that going, or are you guys going to be completely employee based, um, you know, moving forward? Yeah. Uh, automation is very important to us personally. And again, that's just kind of something a uh, long time mechanical engineer. I love machines. Yep. So I'm excited about automation. Um, one of the challenges with automation, though, is you is you design automation, uh, you want to know, uh, and this is true with most process, how to do it manually first. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you've got to kind of perfect that side. And so we've spent some time perfecting how do these things happen from a manual basis with artisan, you know, people putting it together. Uh, but we are and have been actively now designing automation, but it does take time. And when you see many of the people out there say, hey, we're going to have an automated factory. Um, it takes a year or two sometimes to get the equipment in because a lot yeah. of it's custom built, custom designed based on what you did manually. And then it has to be custom software developed. So we're in that uh, queue right now in the middle of doing that. I find it a very exciting time because it's, yeah. it's fun. And I think everybody who saw the, the dancing robots, you know, on, on yeah. social media recently, it's just hard not to get excited about where it's going. But I think it's also important to note that there will still be artisans involved too, um, because we aren't fully, um, th th this still won't be hundreds of thousands of units of each each one unit a year. So there's still a, a combination in our factory of uh, automation that's, uh, you know, a variety of robots that do everything from uh, an automation. Sometimes it's not a robot, sometimes it might be as simple as a conveyor belt that's handling your uh, material transport from, you know, the cage to the, the assembly line. But other times it is very sophisticated pick and place robots or sophisticated uh, material handling robots. Um, we are placing orders for them, we're designing to that. Um, but you'll still see some amount of artisan activity in the business. Um, you might liken it to, the, a specialty car manufacturer that that is making some volume, like Ferrari, where uh, they have uh, some volume, and we see YouTube of their factory. Uh, we see ourselves in that same kind of way, where you have a mixture of very sophisticated artisan people uh, doing some of it, and a mixture of uh, robots doing doing parts of it too that can be uh, sophisticatedly automated. Now, the other nice part is robots are coming down in price, um, yeah. and and the, the software side, there's more and more of them that like us kind of come pre-programmed. And so um, so it is becoming more practical to add automation. Um, now, the, the flip side of that is I hear a lot of people say, hey, is that going to eliminate jobs? And what it does mean is jobs are changing. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, we don't see it eliminating jobs per se, but what it has done is take a job that was a low tech job and made it a high tech job. And I think that's the tough part for, for people watching the video is what do you do about a career? And the answer is, there's going to be fewer and fewer low tech jobs because anything that can be easily done without having to put a lot of thought to it will likely be done in an automated way in the very near future. Um, but things that require, you know, more sophisticated thought and approach uh, are going to remain people type activities. And so um, we, we as a culture and a society have to think about uh, how do we get people educated to, to make sure they continue to stay employed. But the, the total number of jobs, you know, we still see a very significant growing economy in what we're doing. Um, but the jobs are certainly shifting from uh, hand jobs to, to software jobs. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I definitely get that. And I guess, um, you know, I, do you guys kind of have a timeline for, you know, I mean, you guys are growing. I, I was looking at, you know, some of the things that you talked about. And obviously, you know, until you guys really go public, you know, all, all of your numbers aren't out there yet, per se. But, um, you know, do you guys kind of have a timeline for where you really see yourself in, in three years, you know, kind of like the numbers that you're doing? I, I know that you said that, and this is definitely a longer game, you know, being that, you know, you take orders for a year, two years out. Um, you know, where do you kind of see your, you, you know, lightning in two to three years? And then, I, and, and then, you know, this will kind of be like a two part question. You know, how does, um, you know, the, the SPAC, how does that kind of play into, you know, your scaling for lightning? And, and does that kind of push up the timeline of, of some of the things that you had in mind before? Sure. So I'll start with your last question. And yes, the, the SPAC's done two things. One of them is obviously provide a significant amount of capital infusion and working capital infusion, which has a very big accelerating effect because we've, yeah. we've been up till now very limited on capital. And so when you yeah. think about how are you going to automate the factory, you've got to spend money on robots and you have to spend money on automation. We didn't have a lot of capital to do that before. Now we do. Um, same thing with people, um, being able to add a, a large number of people reasonably quickly and add the facility space we need reasonably quickly and add the demonstration vehicles and the other assets reasonably quickly. So the SPAC, uh, obviously going public does that part. But the other part is Gig Capital 3 that we partnered with for the SPAC. Um, they've taken multiple companies public. This is their third uh, um, IPO, uh, you know, public company they've done. But prior to that, the executives there had taken other companies public and run public companies. So that having them now on our team, on our board every day, I'm talking to that group uh, virtually every day. Um, having their team of, of experts has really helped us accelerate the at what is it like to be a public company? What do you have to do to be ready? So there's a lot of back office and regulatory things that have to be done. And so they, they've helped us accelerate that in a very meaningful way. Yeah, that's um, awesome. <clears throat> so for me, uh, Ping's going in raw. We are big on goals here. Uh, I've watched <laughs> a good bit of yours and I have some of your goals that you have listed. Uh, and I'd like <laughs> you to touch on some of them. The first one, Manufacturing capabilities. You have a current uh, 1,000 annual units and you want it at 20,000 annual units by 2025. How's that goal going? Very well. So it, it, three parts to that. One of them is a facility part and we're lucky enough to be on a facility that uh, has a million square feet ready. Um, so we don't have to build a new building. Um, but the other part is we've also made uh, significant progress in with partners. So two sides of our business when we're making a complete electric vehicle, we also have another side of the business where we sell powertrains to strategic partners who install those powertrains either in a new vehicle or a repowered vehicle. Um, we need a lot less facility space in the latter. If we're just building a powertrain, it's much more efficient facility-wise. And uh, we've recently signed up three new partners whose business it is to take powertrains from us and install them at, at their factory. And so that gives us nice leverage and gross lever growth leverage. Um, so I feel very, very confident about the scale side of our ability to manufacture. And then to the other questions there, our ability to... Uh, um, leverage automation. So, because there's kind of two parts. One of them is just raw scale, get more facility, get more partners, get more supply chain. Um, and that's largely a function of, of capital. And we have that and we're doing that and making the decisions. The other part of it is automation. And, and that is happening as well. And so uh, we expect to get about a three to one facilities benefit and people benefit from automation that we were talking about from, you know, whether you think about it as, as robots or conveyor belts, I kind of use that as two extremes. And there's a lot in between like uh, robotic welding and, and other things that, that allow you to do things faster and, and more repeatedly and, and more, uh, you know, more accurately. All right. Goal number two, become <laughs> number one in medium duty urban electric vehicles. Uh, I think, one of the things you you mentioned was you want Lightning E Motors that logo on just about all like mail uh, ambulances, all of them. Can you kind of touch on the opportunity of partnering uh, with one of those bigger package delivery firms or maybe ambulances and how you're going to adjust to their needs to kind of make sure you get that? Right. So so you'll see announcements from us because some of it's been in the works for over a year now, or in some cases two years with many of these groups in terms of developing the partnership. 
And there's two aspects to it. One of them is really catering to the specifics. And, you know, in last mile delivery, it's generally there's most people don't think of that as highly custom, although there is some customization there. But then you get to ambulances and they're they're very much highly customized. And so a little differences in both of those, but our ability and agility to say we're going to do the customization, the engineering work that needs to be done isn't trivial in the sense that there's both we need the expertise and we have the engineering expertise, but you also have to have the people and the availability. And many of the big customers, big OEMs out there don't have spare engineering right now to do this work. Um, and we've ramped up our engineering and have the engineering talent to do the work. Um, and this is you know, what we're passionate about, what we're good at, what we love. So um, very important to note, uh, I think, in terms of, of uh, you know, how do we do that? Uh, but I think uh, when we see taking over, you know, really continuing our growth and, and being the number one, uh, part of it is having uh, more sectors that we're serving. And so we're excited to be bringing on ambulances, excited to bring on, you know, some other nuances like bucket trucks and tow trucks and some of these other nuanced markets that are still reasonably sized, not big enough for, you know, a large OEM to want to go make the investments in, but certainly big enough for us to build a good business, uh, you know, in many cases, a, a uh, nearly billion dollar business in some of the, each of those markets. So um, we're continuing to build and expand new platforms uh, like tow trucks and, and et cetera, uh, but then also uh, continuing to build uh, faster and better and, and more feature rich products. So our telematics, our analytics, the software and dashboard that's in the vehicle that shows you how the vehicle's performing and that what we call human machine interface all those things are important and where we're, you know, in the background, uh, running like hamsters on the treadmill, <laughs> try, try, trying yeah. to get all those things done as well. And some of them are already there. When people drive our vehicle, they've already got a very unique one-off, uh, you know, set of screens and dashboard experience. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity to continue to make that better. And because we've now got a lot of vehicles with fleet customers giving us feedback, um, that feedback loop allows us to, to do some very unique things Whereas people who don't have a vehicle on the road aren't in that feedback loop yet. So they they don't have the customers telling them, well, I drove it and this is my experience. And so um, that's those are all aspects to how we stay in front and, and accelerate in front now that now that we have capital as a public company. Okay. That's awesome. And and last but not least on your goals. And this is uh we actually have this goal and some uh, you know, we, we both have this goal. Um you said Profitable in 2022. Uh, we also want to be green in 2022. How, <laughs> how are we doing it? Um, so, uh, again, very much on track. Um, I originally thought that, it, you know, we'd get it done in 2021 and it got pushed back because of COVID supply chain, et cetera. But there, there's three parts to that that are key. One of them is um, we, we the new supply chain. And so and supply chain's a, a two factor. One of them is it had to mature for all of us. And so one of the challenges in the commercial truck space is uh, from an electrification standpoint, there's a lot of electrification components out there, but many of them are owned somewhat exclusively by one passenger vehicle group who uh, has been in the business a long time and has built them and vertically <laughs> integrated themselves. So when we got in the, it really started heavy electrification three years ago, a lot of the components we needed had a, didn't exist or had a, a two-year lead time. Um, so you'd call up and say, I want to order it. You'd see it in a catalog. You'd see it's available, but you'd ordered it and it takes two weeks to get or two years to get it. So, um, so part of what we've had to do is make some of our own components and vertically integrate a lot of things ourselves. And obviously COVID exasperated that because some things we were buying all of a sudden would get delayed eight weeks or 12 weeks when yeah. the supplier shut their factory down. So part of this uh, uh, profitability has come from us making it, you know, doing vertical integration and owning and making a lot of our own components. Part of it, though, is also coming from volume. And so you can imagine exactly to the question about automation, when you're doing one or two and they're all manual and it's all artisan labor, it's expensive. When your batch side goes up to a couple hundred um, and you can automate everything from how the material gets to the floor to uh, the pick and place of various components, but also even the artisans that are working on it are far, far more efficient because their tools are already ready and batch loaded and and they've done it enough times to be good at it. I use the example of if you've ever put together more than one Ikea desk, <laughs> the first one takes a long time. You get yeah. to number two or number three, you get better at it, a lot better at it. I'm so at number 10 and I'm still, I'm still breaking stuff. 
<laughs> I'm still up till 1 a.m. doing it the next day. <laughs> it does get better though, but yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so Tim, you know, uh, speaking on the financial side of it, um, you know, I think one of the big things that a lot of investors, um, you know, want to know, you know, you got this huge capital infusion. Um, where do you see that capital? Because, you know, profitability is still, um, you know, at least a year out. Um, you know, where do you see that capital taking taking you and how long will that capital last you until, you know, you either need to look for more financing options or, um, you know, or, or you need to raise? So it, we have designed the business to be able to get to profitability without raising more money. Um, now, I'll say that with one uh, uh, caveat that I, I can't go deep into, but we, I believe there will be a lot of an, a lot of uh, acquisition opportunities for us to grow the business and to, to begin to consolidate some of what right now is kind of a, a, a convoluted story in the commercial vehicle space, whether you look at, at things like AI and, and autonomous driving in this space and the technology around that, whether you look at specific components or even uh, vehicle manufacturing. And, and we have an interest in in uh, some of that consolidation, both to uh, better tell the story, but also to drive profitability and to drive efficiencies in the market. Um, and so that that may change, you know, what the market perceives we need or how we how we go about future uh, fundraising. But as far as our current business, our projections to get to 20,000 units by 2025, uh, all of that, uh, we believe, can be done with what we've what, what we've raised in this uh uh, public offering and where we're going. So we're very focused awesome. on not having to keep going back to the market and raising more money. Yeah, we like we like that. Uh, we we like that a lot. Um, you know, and then uh, obviously most of your business is B two B or or business to business. Um, do you see you guys ever kind of expanding or or, or really you know dabbling in um, or customer to customer? Um, or I mean, a uh, business to customer at all, or or do you really see you know inside the next five years just B two B and and really kind of cutting out um, you know if I wanted to go and buy a van for you? So you know we don't stop an individual from buying a van, but our business and so when you think about it, you know so some of the partners we've talked about like Winnebago, um, yeah. we definitely see consumers buying our electric powertrain Winnebago. So but our where our sales team focuses and our in interaction and engagement, uh, I'm certain will continue to be B two B. But that doesn't mean customers won't be able to buy our product; they'll just be buying it from one of our partners. Um, so I, I do think you'll be able to buy a, I, I know you'll be able to buy a, a, a electric RV from a partner of ours that will be, you know, powered by lightning. Uh, you'll be yeah. able to buy electric vans, you know, powered by lightning. Um, so I, it, we do see more and more of that happening with what we call our OEM business, this business where we build the powertrain and other people, uh, you know, install them and leverage them. So uh, I'm excited to say I do expect consumers to, to have vehicles powered by lightning, um, but I don't expect that the the interaction will be directly with lightning makes sense makes sense hey tim we want to thank you uh, we've had fun today um i've enjoyed question. it you guys are great yeah <laughs> uh, i really we are actually in about half an hour about to go on benzinga is there anything you want us to say about you uh <laughs> maybe some breaking news like who knows well, do you, i heard <laughs> we'll you say did it say you were signing some documents today it, uh do do can we get some uh, can we get some uh, leverage here? Uh, I, I'm trying to think if if there's anything close enough. So as as you guys know, the downside to going public is now there's all these constraints about what has to be uh, already yeah, already the sent. The SEC, SEC. So, yeah, like, yes, well. I, I I have, uh, and that's very difficult for me because I I like to share. I want to I want to be able to tell everybody what's going on. And so this is the biggest transition for me in going public is uh, I have to be a lot more careful about what I say. So whoa, whoa, um, Tim, we're nice guys. We won't tell anybody. Well, we promise. I, yeah, I want you to tell somebody. <laughs> You know, I, I, that's what I love about your podcast. You guys are, are telling, you know, really get the message out. So I very much appreciate that. And and it, I, I think, it, you know, what we want people to hear is, it, you know, we, we are focused. Um, we're in a market that, uh, as you pointed out with the questions, a lot of people think about, hey, you know, all the some legacy OEM is going to take this over. And I think uh, we, we it's very clear to us that the legacy OEMs don't want to be in our space, but also that we have a real leg up because we're focused on this this nuanced space, but 
but that this new on space actually is tremendous growth opportunity when you aggregate it all together. And so uh, that's what I hope people get. The other thing we see people being confused about is thinking we're just a retrofitter. Um, we really want people to understand that we make complete vehicles. Yes, we start with a, an, a legacy OEM chassis in most cases. Um, but, uh, it, you know, we're really getting the word out that uh, to both customers and investors that we are a, a complete house. So and some of the other stuff you, you did squeeze out a few things that aren't specific to, it. you know, the automation question you asked, no one else has asked. So that's definitely we haven't talked about that. So that, that's definitely an, an interesting curve that uh, you breaking guys, news, uh, breaking uh, news. Uh, hey, yeah, we got it. We got the breaking news. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. We have absolute. This has been a pleasure. And uh we uh, can't wait to see what Lightning Motors has for and, us. And I'm happy to be on anytime. Just shoot, shoot me an email anytime and I'll, <laughs> I'll join you again any, anytime, any place. All right. Thank you so awesome. much, man. Take care. Thanks, Take care. We appreciate you guys tuning in to another Pennies Going In Raw. We hope you enjoyed the Tim Reeser interview. We have a ton of stuff in the tank to show you guys this new year. Uh, man, we have around five interviews, six interviews that are, are tentatively set up. We really hope to get them out. Uh, no hints, except maybe some hints, uh, because mm -hmm. most of them are were doctrine through Twitter. Um, but, but yeah, man. Yeah. I, and just a side note, you know, we love you guys. We thank you guys for all of your support. We really, really enjoy doing this. And it, it's it's funny. Our our Twitter followers have been getting us interviews, which we love. How cool is that? Yeah, I mean, none of this. I mean, the the very first one was was due to a dude in Atlas, and then after we announced him, uh, two more were given. Like Man Pre got us one, and and another Twitter follower got us another, and and it's been crazy. Uh, I think I think it's up to like th three CEOs from that, and and two really good traders uh, that I think ever, or maybe even a hedge fund manager, who knows? Um, that that everyone's really going to enjoy. And uh, we can't thank you guys enough for, for reaching out to these people, just tagging them in our tweets and stuff. And, and all that stuff really helps us get these guys uh, just getting the word out. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be crazy. I mean, the, the fact that a, a podcast called pennies going in raw is, is going to be interviewing CEOs and, you know, really cool people is crazy. I really have no words we we how often do we just text each other and say this is just wild um you know and and we just really want to say thank you to all our supporters um and, and you know pretty soon hopefully we can do you know a few giveaways oh that would be cool i mean you, you're the one with money here you should definitely <laughs> think about um you know doing some giveaways on here but but uh yeah we we, we can't thank you guys enough and uh I, I should. I did order the shirts. Um, we're looking at around a 10 day turnaround time and I got 300 of them. So Ooh, yeah. hope to see you guys dripped out in, in PGIR gear. All Raw right, dogs. That's your new name, listener. OK, see you guys. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. See you next week. I was actually doing some uh, some research last night and um, I was looking. I saw it said. Uh, that it said on the Google page for you, it said you wrote these ghost books. And then I did more research on it. And it turns out that was another guy who owns a spooky farm in like Pennsylvania named Tim Reeser as well. <laughs> there are a few Tim Reesers and that is that I have written books, but I have not written the ghost books. So that I think, uh, I think that's why they got it confused. <laughs> yes.